Well, today in our passage, if you have your Bible, you can open up as we've been in, in Romans chapter 8. And we're actually going to go through the end of the chapter. This isn't going to finish our, our time, but we're going to go through the end of the chapter uh, today. Just five verses, the final five verses. But these five verses are the peak of this chapter. We've talked about the greatest chapter of all time. The greatest chapter of scripture of all time. If you were here last week, we handed out a little card where you can memorize just a few verses. If you can't memorize all of it, you can memorize eight. Uh, Hopefully some of you guys have done your homework. I had some people tag me and say, I'm doing my homework. I'm working on it. Uh, I'm sorry, sent you home with some summer homework, but that's how it goes. Um, But we're in this greatest chapter of all time in this section is the crescendo. I mean, this is, this is where we, we reach the peak, the apex of where we're trying to go in Paul's declaration in Romans chapter eight, what he's telling, the questions he's answering, this is the peak. And so we're gonna see where he lands today. This is his final question that he's gonna ask. And remember, we talked a couple weeks ago, he asked a lot of questions right here at the end. And we talked about how all of those questions that he asked, the answer to those questions are deeply theological. They tell, tell us a lot about God, a whole lot about who God is, about how he works. They're deeply theological, but they're also deeply personal. They, tell, they say a lot about us and how God views us. And we're gonna see that today, but then when we put those two things together, when we understand how deeply theological they are, how important they are to understand God, and we understand how they impact us. They're also deeply transformational. So we're going to look at this final question that he asks in Romans chapter 8, verse 35. He says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Are these things going to separate us? He says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Four times in these final five verses, he asks, or sorry, in these final five verses, three times, he asks the question, or he talks about God's love. He talks about Christ's love. He says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? If there's some, one thing you need to understand today, it's that God loves you. One of the most foundational things you'll find from start to finish, from front to back, as you look in God's word and as you look in history, it is that God loves you. Now that looks a little bit different for everybody, whether you've received his love or not, but God loves you. This is a common theme, all of scripture. It's a common theme in the book of Romans. It's a common theme in all of Paul's letters. But Paul is talking in this passage about a truth that God loves you. And I'm going to repeat that many times because there's some people in the room that still don't get it. Even if you're a Christian, sometimes we don't get it. You say, I've surrendered my life to Jesus. I know God loves me right here, but here's the problem. Paul's talking about this truth, but he talks about how this truth is threatened by the circumstances that you and I encounter. It's challenged by the things of life. So he starts listing these things. He says, there's things in life that can, these experiences in life that can make you question whether God loves you. But the threat you need to understand is not about whether or not it's true. It's about whether or not you and I believe that it's true. These questions, this question he's answering, these things that he's going to bring up are about whether or not we believe it's true. He says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? This word separate, the original language means to forcefully or intentionally pull apart, to be separated, to be pulled apart. He says, who is going to separate you from the love of Christ? Who is it that could possibly do that from the love of Jesus? Now, if you grew up in the church, There's probably a song that you've heard or sung, maybe when you were little, maybe you still sing it today. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, right? The Bible tells me so. Well, here's what happens. It is true. We might know that it's true that Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible says it. We might know it, you might have heard it, but often we don't understand it. How it could be possible, but it is true. Some of you today don't really know that it's true. Some of you, maybe you say, I don't believe that that's true. How could God actually love me? Do you know what I've done? Do you know the things that are going on in my life? I reached out to somebody this week because I saw a a post from somebody that they said, this world's just not for me. You know, I've tried, I've tried, I've tried, but I just keep making mistakes and God can't love me. 
He says, I can't believe this, this could possibly true, be true. He said, I'm so broken. I'm a broken person. We had some people that reached out to try to connect to this person because this person who had, who had been through a lot and had come to know Christ a little bit later and, and had tried and struggled and failed, kept saying, I just can't believe it. I can't believe God could love me because I'm so broken. And some of you today might be in here and you say, I can't believe that God could actually love me. I know that God loves everybody, but I'm not sure that he loves me. I'm not sure I believe it. Some of you say, you know what, I believe it. I just, I'm not seeing it. I don't feel that God loves me. I'm not seeing it in my daily life. And here's the reality, because this truth, it is a truth. This truth is under attack. And so Paul starts listing these seven experiences that the children of God actually experience that might make you question whether or not you are loved by God. He goes through them. He says, will tribulation, he says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? He says, will tribulation, this word literally means to be squeezed or to be placed under a lot of pressure the pressures of this life, the struggles that you're going to go through in your life. He says, will tribulation, will those things separate you from the love of Christ? I want you to know the answer to all of these is no. He says, will these things separate you from the love of Christ? He says, will distress, this word literally means to be hemmed in, to be like imprisoned or be in a narrow and confined space. Some of you might feel like you're imprisoned. Maybe in your job, you feel like you're imprisoned. Maybe in your personal life, maybe in your marriage, maybe in some form or fashion, you feel like you're just kind of stuck with nowhere to go. Like I can't move forward in any way because I feel like I'm just stuck. Like there's nothing, no place for me to go, nowhere for me to be able to move. I feel like I'm hemmed in. I feel like I'm in prison. I'm stuck. He says, what about persecution? Will persecution separate you from the love of Christ? And here's what's happening. Right when Paul's writing this, the Christians in Rome, the Christians in that time, the people that he's writing to are going through this persecution and they're going to be for the next 200 years in Rome, for the next 200 years in Rome. They're gonna be continually going through this. And Paul says, will persecution separate you from the love of Christ? And these last four he talks about in this list of seven, the last four might be a result of the persecution. So he's talking about specific things that may be a result of the persecution they're experiencing. He says, what about famine where you're lacking food? What about nakedness where you're lacking shelter? What about peril where you're lacking safety? And he says, what about the sword? Which basically he's saying, what about death? Is that going to do it? Is that going to cut it? And then he says this. He says, as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Now he says, as it is written, he's pointing back. When you see that, it's pointing back to something that was written previously. This is in the Old Testament, Psalm 44. Why is Paul quoting this verse? It's because it was one of the Psalms of one of the sons of Korah. And at that time, the people of God had been brought into the land that had been promised to them. But this Psalm was written by the son of Korah. He's saying, we're be, we aren't being valued by other people. We might be where we're supposed to be, but God, we're being attacked from all angles. We're not being valued. Nobody cares about us. We're being slaughtered every day. This was happening in the Old Testament. So why would Paul write this? He's saying, by the way, for you guys in Rome and for us here today, he's saying this has always been true. This has always been true. That the people of God are going to be persecuted. They're going to be attacked. That is always true. Now, when I talk about persecution, I try to be really careful to help us all understand because I know it's not a fun topic to think about. I know it's not something that we're all really excited about and things like that, even though in the New Testament, we see that a lot of the believers were grateful that they were persecuted. It's amazing. But here's the thing, I wanna remind us all when we talk about persecution, what we're actually talking about. Because there are some people who are being persecuted and they say, I'm being persecuted, but really they're just being persecuted because they're being stupid. They're making bad choices. They're acting like idiots. Not because they're following Jesus and loving people and telling people about Jesus and living based on biblical principles and biblical standards. That's not it. Some people are just, they say, you know what, I'm a Christian and people don't like me. Sometimes maybe it's just because you're not likable. So when we talk about persecution, I want us to understand what I'm talking about. By the way, we're all lovable, but sometimes we're all not likable, right? Right. But here's the thing, when we're talking about persecution, we're talking about living according to God's standards, 
loving people the way Jesus loved people, talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, living up to uh, the, the biblical model of what he has, which is really difficult in this world to take a firm stand. It's really difficult, but when we take a firm stand on God and his word, you're going to be persecuted. It's going to happen. Paul says it's always happened. To the people in Rome at this time, if you've ever been to Rome, who's been to Rome before? The main place everybody wants to go in Rome, the Colosseum, right? Everybody, if you've been to Rome, you've probably been to the Colosseum. I've never been to Rome, never seen the Colosseum. But what was happening in the Colosseum at that time? When Paul's writing this and what continued to happen for the next few hundred years? Christians were being taken in there. Were being put in the, in the arena, in the amphitheater with animals that would slaughter them and kill them. They were being put in there with gladiators. And people would watch and people would cheer as Christians were being murdered just because they're Christians. Now, there were some other people that did it as well that they would throw in there just for fun. But most of the people they threw in there were Christians. And it was because they were Christians. So Paul is writing this saying, we're being like led like sheep to the slaughter. But I want you to notice, he says, for your sake, this is what was written, for your sake. This is talking to God. When, when the son of Korah wrote this, he was talking to God. He said, for your sake, because we're living for you, we're being led like sheep to the slaughter. Every day we are being killed. And this was happening. Christians were being killed by animals, by gladiators. And Jesus said, if you remember, when you're persecuted, guess what? You're in really good company because they did that to the prophets too. The people that have come before me, Jesus said, the people that were the prophets of God who were declaring the word of God to people, he says, they were being persecuted. They were being killed. And so if you feel like you're being persecuted, you're in really good company. And then he adds to that. He says, by the way, they don't love me either. So if they don't love you, guess what? You're in good company with Jesus. This is what he's talking about. Then the next verse Romans 8, 37 says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We're going to talk about that in a couple weeks. And in this last section, he says, I am sure. Everybody say sure. sure. Everybody say sure. sure. The word here is persuaded. I am confident. I am persuaded. He says, I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's try that again. I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Thank you. If there's a time to amen, amen, that's the crescendo right there. That's the moment when you look at all of Romans chapter eight, that's it right there. He ended with sword. He said, will sword do that to you? He's talking about death. Now he comes and he says, people are dying. People are being killed over and over and over again. And then he gets to death again. He starts with death. He says, I am confident that death will not do it. Why would he say this? Paul also wrote this. He says, to live is Christ. And what did he say about dying? He said, to die is gain. Heard John Piper a few years ago. Say that, that basically Paul was saying, if I live, you're going to get more of Jesus. If I die, I'm going to get more of Jesus. He says to die is gain. Will death separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? He basically says these things might send me to God, but they're not going to separate me from him. These things might end in me going to experience his love like I never have before, personally, face to face, in heaven, for all of eternity with him but they will not separate me from him. Then he says, what about life? Death will do at the end of my life, but what about all the things that happen while I'm here? While you are here, will that do it? He says, that won't do it. What about angels? Can angels do it? Nope. Can rulers do it? Nope. What about the things in the present? The things you're going through right now? What about the things to come? Do we have to worry about the things to come that they're gonna somehow separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? He says, nope. What about powers? 
He's talking in this case, a lot of people would say he's talking about Satan and demons and stuff like that. Do they have the ability to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus? He says, nope. What about height? What about depth? He's talking about all of time. He's talking about all of people. He's talking about all of space, height, depth, everything he's talking about. He's trying to cover it all. And if that's not enough, he says, or anything else in all of creation. He says, if I haven't said it enough, I've tried to cover all the bases I possibly can so that you can know what and who could possibly separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. But just in case you can think of something else, he says, what about anything else in all of creation? Can those separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus? He says, I am sure that no one, no thing, and no time can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. What can separate us from the love of Christ? No one. No one can separate, separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I want you to think about that for a second because here's what happens is a lot of us, we think of no one and we think of outside. I want you to know no one outside of you, but I want you to know that you can't separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. We have a tendency to say, well, no one out there, but you don't know, again, what I've done. You don't know what I'm guilty of. You don't know the things I'm ashamed of, the things that I carry around with me. He says, no one. By the way, you are one, and so no one includes you. He says, no one can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Then he says, no thing. Nothing you encounter in your life, no thing that you encounter in your life, no circumstances that you encounter in your life can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And then he says, no time, he says, at no time will you be separated. Now, how can Paul know that these things would not separate us? Why can he say, why can he say, I'm sure, I am confident. He says, I have traveled, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long. I have endured many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and often gone without food. I have been cold and I have been naked. How can he say this? Because he had experienced every single one of them. Except for one. He hadn't experienced death yet, right? Obviously, if he's writing this, he had not experienced death, but he also wasn't very far from that either. History tells us that not long after this, not long after he wrote this, he was in Rome and he was either beheaded in Rome or just taken just outside the city to be beheaded. In this same city that he's writing this letter to the church in that city, that's where he's going to end up being beheaded, being killed himself. Then he experienced it. But Paul said, I am persuaded, I am convinced, I am certain, I am absolutely sure. How could Paul have been persuaded that the love of God in Christ Jesus would never be separated from him? How could he be so certain? Here's how he lists it. He says, because I've been shipwrecked, that's how I know. I've been imprisoned, beaten, flogged, stoned, whipped. I've been hungry, thirsty, cold, naked, rejected. I've been mocked. Many of us go through times like that and we, we would look at those situations and we would say, God can't love me. God can't love me. If I'm dealing with all this, then God couldn't really love me. Paul went through all of that and said, I am convinced that God loves me because I've been through all that. It wasn't just because he went through all that. It's because when he went through all that, he knew Jesus was with him. God was right there with him. Most of us would say, if I had to go through all those things, I can't be sure that God loves me. Paul says, I've been through all those things, and that makes me more sure that God loves me because he's carried me through it all. He says, I am persuaded. I am convinced. I am absolutely certain that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus might not have always felt that way, by the way. Might not have always looked that way. People might have even looked from the outside and said, if, if there's a God, he can't really love that guy. That's all he's been through. Paul says, it might not look like it, it might not feel like it, but I know it's true. Every night, almost every night, I try to 
almost every night. I do it uh, every, every time I can, every now and then. I, I ask my wife to get to do this. But every night before my kids, before my wife and I go to sleep, uh, my kids are usually asleep in our house and I'll go and I'll walk into their room and I'll give them a kiss on the forehead or cheek or something like that and just say, I love you. And they're asleep. They have no idea it's happening. But you know what? I do that because I love them. They might never know I do that, but it doesn't matter to me. I mean, I want them to know I love them. I think they do when they're awake. They, they know I love them. And even though sometimes I, I make mistakes and I, I, I get it wrong and don't show that love and stuff like that, I, I love my children. And so I go in and I usually kind of put their covers back on them and turn them if they need to be spun around or whatever it is, kiss them. And for my boys, I say, I love you, buddy, and kiss them. And then for my daughter, I say, I love you, princess. And most of the time they don't respond. Every now and then my daughter will kind of like turn over and have this little silly grin on her face that she doesn't ever remember. But I love my children. Whether they know it or feel it in that moment doesn't matter to me. It's still true. And so I do it because I love them. This is true for all of us. The question I want to ask is, Paul says he's persuaded. Are you persuaded? Are you persuaded today? that God loves you. Let me ask another question maybe that might reveal this a little bit more. What do you think can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Maybe in your mind you might think, well, you know, a loss of a job or maybe a loss of a business or a dream or maybe just, you know, you've been challenged and somebody challenged you and you're not sure. Maybe these doubts kind of creep in. Maybe loss of health, maybe loss of somebody you love, maybe a spouse left you, maybe, maybe you lost somebody that you loved and cared about, loss of a loved one. Here's what happens. I want us to understand the difference here. A lot of times those things can actually stop us from loving God. That's what a lot of those things do. And what we end up doing is we transfer that over to whether or not God loves us. But a lot of times they could pull us away from loving God. But I want you to know that none of those things can separate God from loving you. See it all through Scripture. That you are loved no matter what. That God deeply loves you, not just a little bit. But he deeply loves you. He has set his love on you. And it cannot be taken away by anyone, by anything, at any time in your life. God loves you. So in your mind, when you look at this, if you want to have the best view, we talked about how this is the peak, this is the crescendo. If you want to have the best view of your life, it's going to come through this understanding. This is why this is probably known as the greatest chapter of all time. This passage, this section right here is the most critical understanding that you and I will ever have. And this is the peak. This is looking, having a bird's eye view of everything that's going on is to say, God loves me. I don't understand why. I don't deserve it by any means, but God loves me. This is the view that we get to have. This is the peak of the conversation. If you want to have the best view of Romans chapter 8, it's all based on that, that God loves you and nothing can separate you from his love. If you want to have the best view of the book of Romans as a whole, it's that God loves you and nothing can separate you from his love. If you want to have the best view of scripture as a whole, start to finish, it's that God loves you and nothing can separate you from his love. If you are one of his children in Christ Jesus, nothing can and nothing will. Because it doesn't matter how strong you are, how bad you are, how awful you are. God says, I've got a hold of you. And you're one of mine. And I love you no matter what. So if you're wondering today and you're not fully persuaded today, I hope you'll listen to Paul. It's one thing for somebody who's never gone through anything to say, oh, God loves you and it's so easy, it's so good that God loves us. But when you listen to Paul and all the things that he's been through and he says, I am persuaded and I'm convinced having gone through everything just about that you could possibly go through on this planet, he says, I'm convinced that nothing will separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. This is the view you and I must have that God loves you. 
And if you're one of his children, there's no one, no thing, and no time. Nothing in all of creation can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. May we be people who in our heart and our soul are persuaded of this truth in a way that changes the way we walk out of here, in a way that changes the way we wake up, in a way that changes the way we go to sleep, in a way that changes the way we live in every space and every place that God takes us. No one, no thing, at no time can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus.